Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, machaba, ciao, bonjour, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hey, my name is Jedley. Welcome to Reading with Your Kids. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts, in the shadow of the great Blue Hills. We are so honored and so wicked happy that you join us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. We do that by sharing fun, thoughtful, and thought-provoking conversations with fascinating people who just happen to be writing books for kids of all ages. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show and let them know that they can hear us on the WREB AM FM 24-7 radio network and they can find us on the iHeartRadio app, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Good Pods, Amazon Music, Audible, Podcast Attic, wherever you find your favorite shows. We have three amazing guests for you today. Kathleen Long Bostrom will be returning to the show to celebrate Daddy Tell Me. Christina Dixon will be here to celebrate I Am the Moon. And Sarah Gaston will be here to tell us about the relatable Christian stories that she writes that are not at all cheesy. Hey, are you ready to ignite a passion for reading in your students? Introducing BookAndAuthor.com, your gateway to literacy connections. With BookAndAuthor.com, connecting your school with talented authors of captivating kids' books has never been easier. Simply visit our user-friendly website and explore our extensive database of authors. Filter your search based on budget, genre, and availability. Discover the perfect match for your school and your students. But that's not all. With BookAndAuthor.com, you have the power to request a proposal. Let vetted authors come to you with their tailored ideas, ensuring an unforgettable literacy experience for your students. Don't wait any longer to inspire young minds through the magic of books. Visit bookandauthor.com today and open the door to a world of literacy connections. Bookandauthor.com, where literacy comes to life. Before we invite our guest into the studio, I would love to invite you to visit a very special website. It's clownswithoutborders.org. Clownswithoutborders.org. This is a group that I absolutely adore. I am part of Clowns Without Borders, and I had the honor of being part of the 2023 tour of El Salvador. I had so much fun joining with artists from all over the world to bring a smile to people who really needed it and, and, and really appreciated it, too. And we would love for you to join us as a monthly joy maker. Uh, the joy makers, they're a family of people just like you who love to laugh and make other people feel good. So please take a moment and visit clownswithoutborders.org and consider joining me as a joy maker. Hey, we are really, really excited. We are welcoming back one of our favorite guests. She's coming to us from Southern California. Please welcome back to the show, Kathleen Long Bostrom. Hey, Kathy, how are you? Great to be back and to connect again about books and um from from one coast to the other, I think we've connected this way, so that's great. Isn't isn't it amazing? We are living in a time now. You're much younger than I am, but we're still, you know. Did you ever imagine when you were younger that at one day we'd be able to sit in our rooms on opposite sides of the continent and be able to not only talk to each other but see each other and not have to pay a fortune for it? That's the amazing part, isn't it? Yeah. We, you know, we we grew up with those uh, phones that were connected to the wall with curly cords, and um, the thought of a phone doing anything more than being a phone was unimaginable, not something we have ever thought about. And long distance calls were where you had to do very surreptitiously or quickly <laughs> because they were so expensive. And and yes, here we are talking face to face, literally. Um, from one side of the U.S. to the other, and and um, that's a great uh, that's a great thing about technology connecting people. I think when it, it does it in the right ways. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. 
tech is this double-edged, I don't want to say sword because that implies weapon, but it really is. It, 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 it's such a beautiful thing if, if it's used in the right way. It, it's such a right. wonderful thing and such a, such a gift for everybody. But, of course, we um, always encourage families to talk to their kids about technology so that they're using it respectfully and safely. Right, yeah. and to encourage him to keep reading hardcover books, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so before we, before we start talking about your new book, Daddy, Tell Me a Story, we need to celebrate the fact that since the baby came, the book you celebrated here um, on your last visit has be- recently become an award-winning book. Yes, it, I, it was entered in the Northern Dawn Book Awards and one in the poetry category, so uh, under the Northern Lights Book Awards. And that was a, a great honor because they have librarians and teachers and people in the field who read and um, judge the books. So it was, a, it was a great company of people that were endorsing it. So I, I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, uh, that's, that's really wonderful. Tell us about Daddy, Tell Me a Story, please. Okay, Daddy, Tell Me a Story probably began 25 or 30 years ago um, with our own children. My husband and I were always really good about sharing books with them and taking time to read. And and at night, we would take turns with each of the three children, each of us, reading with them and often falling asleep in the process by the end of the evening. But just taking the time to read and share the picture books and but also letting them use their imaginations in creating their own stories. And I think in a way, um, because my husband and I were pastors and preachers and storytellers, They've all become storytellers in their own way. So the book was inspired by that experience of of reading with a child. But in this story, actually, they're making up a story as they go. So uh, Sophie asks her father, Daddy, tell me a story. And which one would you like, Sophie? And she launches in and pretty much takes over the whole story. So, <laughs> But it, it it conveys such a loving connection between the parent and child. And like, okay, this is what we're doing. So I think uh, trying to encourage children to and, and families, parents, to, to read with their kids and to enjoy it. Um, so it kind of began a long, long time ago. And it's gone through a lot of rights, rights and rewrites and edits and and rejections, and uh, finally, a few years ago, I reworked it, and and now it's a book. So, it's uh, it's exciting. I think it's a better book today than it would have been had it been picked up 20 years ago, because I changed the character of the little girl mm-hmm. to being a little more uh, outspoken in her own way, and to be more creative with the story in her way, and the father going along with that and encouraging her. So. So it's a better story than it would have been. It got frustrating over the years. You know, you want everything snapped right up. doesn't always happen. Yeah. This one was worth worth the wait yeah. for me, and I hope for the reader as well. Yeah. You know, as you were speaking about this little girl who asked her dad to tell the story, and then she kind of takes over and is telling the story herself, I thought of my daughter, um, who is okay. now a very capable 27-year-old woman. But one of the things that really struck me um, is that she has this ability that I I, I have um, of being able to be in the middle of a crisis, mm-hmm. whether it's big or small, but being being able in, in the midst of that crisis to be able to breathe and say, this is going to make a great story someday. <laughs> right. Without panicking and thinking. So it's like, yeah, this is we're this isn't great, but it's going to work out, mm-hmm. and we're going to be able to laugh at it later on in life when and, we tell the story later. Yeah. yeah, and I think that that's a real, um, I think that's a superpower for her because it it, you know, she's able to approach problems and and uh, kind of handle different situations in a in a much calmer, more mindful way. Uh, do you think that's something that people are born with or do you think that this this process that we're all doing and celebrating here on the show is a way to help kids get into stories and into 
uh, teach them how to become storytellers themselves, and maybe that helps them look at different situations in a more empowered way. Right. I, that's an interesting question. And I, I love that about your daughter, that she can look at it and say, this will be a great story. And usually some of the worst things we're going through or at the moment things that we're struggling with um, become the best stories later. Either the ones we laugh at or the ones that have shaped us into the people we become along the way. And being able to see it in that kind of a light is, is a real gift. I think reading with kids and introducing them to stories and characters that face challenges or struggles or um, they show a child, you know, one of the things that's uh, very prominent and necessary in writing a children's story is that the child has to solve the problem. You can't have the parent fixing everything and or an adult coming in and making it all better. It's kind of a, a, a rule that we try to follow. The child has to solve the problem. So in that way, I think also reading stories and books and seeing children solving problems and 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 coming out like your daughter is being able to look at things with a, a, either a positive bend or at least to to find um, solace in the fact that this is just going to be part of my story and and that's a good thing. So I think I like that about children's books. I think it's a very good rule. Mm -hmm. They have to be the hero. They have to solve the problem. They have to tell the story. So if kids see that happening as they're growing up in the books that are read to them, I think that also helps them build that character uh, in themselves. Yeah. You, know, you know, I can do this kind mm -hmm. of a thing. Yeah, and, and I love when we're reading with our kids, asking our kids, well, what would you do? Mm -hmm. And what do you mm -hmm. think about this? And what do you think about that? Understanding that whatever our kids say is back to us, is right. We're asking them their opinion, so it's they're right. not going to get it wrong. They get right. it right. You know, you might not agree with it, and that's okay. And you can talk about it, but it's just a way of empowering kids, letting them know this this person that's the most important person in your life is interested in what you think um, yeah. and um, thinks that that you can solve this this problem. Right. Values your opinion and listens to what you have to say and. Um, right. I think sometimes books end up stopping in the middle of them because it has uh, elicited a conversation that has uh, uh, segued into um, a, a great and golden opportunity to talk with your child. And sometimes for them to raise something that's been they're struggling with that you don't even maybe know about that might come up as you're working with them and telling a story. Yeah, I did have a book I wrote once. Um, Papa's gift. It was a little girl and her grandfather and how she struggles with when he dies. And she has all these different emotions. And I wrote the book when I was a pastor because I found that adults had a really hard time talking to their children about grief and grieving mm -hmm. or and death. And they would be sad if their child was sad or upset if the child was mad about it. And I said, all those things are normal. So I wrote this story to convey a little girl that experiences all these different emotions but works through her grief by doing that. And sometimes I would give that book to a family who was didn't know how to talk to a child about death, and they wouldn't even get through the book because the child would stop partway through and start talking about what was troubling them or what made them sad about the loss of this friend or a relative or um, and it, it just, I said, that's good. You don't have to finish the book. Yeah. If you've engaged with that child in a conversation, there's nothing better than that. So just go with it. So what you say, I think, really uh, relates to that as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I know that that Since the Baby Came was a collection of, of poems, and they were mm -hmm. all written in different styles. Uh, what about Daddy Tell Me a Story? Is this more of a narrative, or is it, too, a collection of poems? Yeah, that no, this is one of the few books I've written that isn't written in verse. Um, the Daddy Tell Me a Story was, each poem was a different format, and that, that was a wonderful challenge, and I wanted children to hear poetry and all these different ways of it being 
told and in this book it's it's a more of a once upon a time and a little girl and then um so it's it's a it's a narrative story it's it's not poetic but i think one of the keys when you're writing a children's book is knowing which way to write it and i i have uh, taught classes on writing poetry for children and one thing to ask is um does this book have to be written in poetry? What's the reason for that? I mean, I love writing in poetry, and I, I gravitate toward it, but is the story told, told best in a narrative form or in a poetic form? Um, so I think that's always a good question to start with. This this one, because it was a, a, a story about a story, a <laughs> story within a story, this format worked just telling it in, in the narrative form. So... Uh, little the little girl just keeps interrupting and changing, changing how how the story plays out, and the da- dad just goes with the flow. So that fit the way this story had to unfold. Yeah, yeah, I I love that. How would you, for you know, one of the things I hear from parents sometimes is like, oh, I love that book, but my kid made me read it five hundred times, yeah. and they're just like, uh-huh. <laughs> and I always tell them you can read you can. You know, read the book 500 times, but you can read the book 500 different ways. Right. And yes. How would, what, what, Point. what would you suggest to the parent that's out there that's about to read Daddy Tell Me a Story for the fifth or the 50th or the 500th time? How, how could they yeah. make it different? Oh, I like that question. I'm trying to provide, uh, the, the publisher and I are coming up with resources to use along with the book that will help uh, help with that i think and ways to engage with the story or become creative as a leap off of the story so maybe as the child and i it's a it's a father and a little girl um i wanted to write about a daddy and a child but i think i'd like to say that the book doesn't have to be a father reading to a a, a daughter it could be any adult reading to a child uh, of any connection and then you just say, now, what would you do? So Sophie wants to be a, a what, a, a, you know, a dragon trainer? What would you, would you think that would be, what would that be like for you? Or, or in this story, uh, the, the father's the one kind of nervous about the fire-breathing dragon and the little girls. Oh, those that's great, you know. So it would be a good chance to say, uh, oh, you be like daddy would you rather have a dragon that blew bubbles out of its nose or what would you do if you could make your own dragon what would you have that dragon do and then well because this dragon does certain things well what would your dragon do and what what colors would it be and would it you know because she describes the color of the wings and the polka dots and all these uh, different attributes of this dragon so we're going to try to do a make your own dragon craft and things but you know, you can stop the story and just say, "What about that? Would you would you be afraid of a fire breathing dragon, or uh, what would you do if you came across a dragon?" You know, you could make it very playful and, um, you know, just stop and ask questions. You might not even get through the story. And one thing I'd like for parents and children to do, or adults and children, with this book is then do their own story. So I'm going to write a little piece of uh, a little. Um, handout that says how to write your own story and then uh, these what you need you start with a character and then what would that character be and so that you could and I hope in the long run this book will encourage uh, parents and children to um, to write their own stories yeah or keep saying parents but any adult and child um, like let's 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 us write our own story what would it be what would it be about and I think I think uh, families People could have a lot of fun, you know, creating their own books, yeah. stories. Absolutely. And it would be more precious than to have that. Like I'm going through files and I'm finding books my kids wrote when they were six years old and they're in their 30s. And I, yeah, I've hung on to everything because yeah. it showed their uh, evolution as now they're all in the film business and they're storytellers. But it shows where they started writing their own stories in their own way and in their own style and in their own voice. So uh, I hope this book can help, you know, uh, excite people to do that kind of a thing. Absolutely. Well, it sounds like it. And I think this that is, it's such a great, uh, you know, um, whether your kids are going to grow up to be creatives or accountants, just 
giving them, empowering them to tell their own stories. Tell their own story, it's right. Just, it's exactly. a beautiful, beautiful thing. Hey, Kathy, we wouldn't be able to finish this story without asking you where we can go to find out more about Daddy, Tell Me a Story. Okay, well, um, I'm going to be sharing information and have been on my uh, website, www.kathleenlongbostrom.com. The publisher is Worthy Kids, and if you go to their website, that's where they'll uh, we'll have resources and uh, more in- information about the book. It's already listed in um, online bookstores. I'm, I'm hoping people will go to their local bookstores and uh, ask for it. I want to do a, a story time at libraries, so I'm hoping to introduce people to it that way. But it, it's widely available. It will be um, released on April 17th, uh, no, 16th, April 16th. And at that point, um, it will be available just about anywhere. Um, but I'd, I'm always grateful when people ask for it to be put in a bookstore so other people can find it that aren't people who just know my books or about me. So I, I'm really excited to, sh- to, to, be, to go around and read this to people, uh, read this to kids. But that's where you can find it mostly on either the publisher's website, just go to any online bookstore. I like to support the independent bookstores um, as well, who make a big effort to get a lot of good books out into the world. Um, so uh, that, that's the basics. Awesome. We've had a great time speaking to the author of Daddy, Tell Me a Story. Our guest has been the award-winning author, Kathleen Long Bostrom. Hey, Kathy, thanks so much for being with us. What a pleasure. The time goes so fast. I Now I'm inspired to sit down and work on my next story. So thank you for that. I love it. <laughs> Keep you posted. This episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by the adventures of Toby Baxter, book two, River Home for the Holidays. It is a Reading With Your Kids certified great read written by Tim Wright. River Home for the Holidays delivers a captivated blend of humor, danger, and inspiration. For lovers of fantasy with mythical creatures, this book is a must-read, promising, a thrilling, and heartwarming adventure. Dive into the enchanting world of River Home alongside Toby Baxter and you won't be disappointed. It is a Reading With Your Kids certified great read, great middle grade novel. You want to add this to your family library. The Adventures of Toby Baxter, book two, River Home for the Holidays, written by Tim Rice. Hey, my friends, I know we are going to have a great time today. Our guest is celebrating her new children's book. It's called I Am the Moon. She's not coming to us from the moon, but she's coming to us from an equally cool place, Columbus in Ohio. Please welcome Christina Dixon. Hey, Christina, how are you? Oh, hello. I'm well. How are you doing? And thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate it. I'm delighted to have you on the show. I am the moon. Tell me about this book, please. Okay. So it was created um, while it actually, I got my inspiration from my four-year-old son. Um, His name is Jabari, and uh, it was during our bedtime stories that he asked me, Mommy, is the moon made of cheese? And I said, no. But if it was, and then we created all these stories, these types of stories that would happen if the moon tasted like cheese and it would be the best cheese and then we would have to protect the moon because people would eat it. And that night, uh, so many book titles flooded me. But this particular book kept asking questions. And it would, uh, some, some of the questions would be, if I lived on the moon, um, would, would time work the same way? Mm-hmm. So I then researched to see I found out that it takes the moon 29 days to revolve around the earth. So technically speaking, if you lived on the moon, you would, one moon day would be equivalent to a month of, a month's worth of earth days. So one moon day equals 30 days on earth. Wow. So, yeah. (laughs) 
That's yeah. That's that, that is hard to conceive. I thought it was really cool, and then I thought about, and, and then what would happen? What would happen during an eclipse? Like here, we get to see, as you know, the solar eclipse is happening on April the eighth, and we get to see, you know, the sun go away. But if you lived on the moon, technically, you would see the Earth go away. <laughs> so. I loved thinking about the possibilities of if you were a moonling, what would you see that would be so different from from the Earth? And so the more questions that came in with the book, um, I started thinking, well, are, is there sound in space? And I actually did uh, read different uh, re scientific research articles. Uh, and one spoke about uh, when stars vibrate, we can find the frequency and that's kind of like a star singing. So I'm like, oh my goodness, stars sing in space. So the story just kept building itself. And then lastly, when I knew it was time to write, I heard this little voice, I'm like, can I go? And I was like, oh my God, I am hearing tiny voices in my head that know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when I started writing and it just, it all came out. Wow. That's what a great way to birth a book. Thank you. Well, Nebula, they have an am an amazing way that they birth a star. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, it, oh, boy, one of the, Christina is referring to uh, a STEM is Family Fun activity that we just recorded that you can find up on YouTube. And it teaches us how we can work with our kids to create our own nebula in a jar. And it is so cool. So you have to check that out. Um, I, I love this this idea that the questions, I think that that's such a – we've talked here in the podcast so much about, you know, parents are kids' first and most important teachers – and one of the ways that we really empower kids is when we're reading to them, when we're doing something with them, and we ask them questions. What do you think? And we're asking those questions knowing that there's no right or wrong answer. What we're looking to do is to just get our kids curious and also to empower them by, by letting them know that the most important person in their life, their parent, cares about what they think and is curious about them that's right absolutely so when jabari asked me about the moon like is it made of cheese like he was like mommy who turns the light on and off during the day and that made me research you know about the different moon faces and i found out about earth shine i wish i found out about earth shine when i was a kid it's the coolest thing and so just by him asking me different questions, and I love to kind of, ex I love to expand his brain, and I want him to go, and I want him to dream big and imaginate big, and then we can create this this big, beautiful adventure world together, and it's like you're, you get to walk in your world in your head, or, or play it out, or go play with your friend, so yeah. I love the whole process. You know, I, I think, you know, kids are going to hear in their lifetime you can't, you can't, you can't so often. And we want our kids to grow up in a world that is full of wonder, that is full of love, that where everybody feels included and respected and loved. But our kids are going to hear, oh, that, that's not realistic. That can't happen. There's this problem, there's that problem, there's this ism and that ism. And it's impossible to fix those things. That it's not impossible. We can't let our kids think it's impossible. So the way we start, we kind of build up a resistance to that. You can't by teaching them that they can and getting them to wonder and ask those questions. Absolutely. And to your point, the theme of the book is actually never stop dreaming. So I was told as a, as a young person, you know, that you, I don't think that adults kind of mean to I think they're like oh you need, just need to touch down a little bit <laughs> but sometimes you need to encourage their their imagination their excitement and just kind of let them see where it goes so there were some points because I do dream quite big I dream larger than life most times <laughs> um, so but you have to allow them to do that you have to allow yourself to do that 
And so the theme of the book is Never Stop Dreaming. And I hope that when people, when guardians, grandparents, parents, when they're reading the books to the, the, book to the, uh, to the kids, that they start dreaming about what it is that they used to do just naturally. It, you know, you, you could, time would just, just go away when you're doing whatever it is that you love. And so I'm, I'm hoping that the book will then inspire them, not only the kids, but the adults to think, well, what did I used to do? What, what, what was the one thing I love to do? And maybe I should get back to it. Yeah. Hey, I have a question. I, and I don't, I, I, I don't know if there's a right or a wrong answer. I don't know if we know the answer yet, but all of the technology, I used to dream that one day I would be able to have this thing in my pocket where I could see somebody, you know, like the, the, the Dick Tracy um, wristwatch where it, it was a, a walkie-talkie and you could call anybody in the world on your wristwatch and uh, there, there'd, there'd be video calls. But that was, you know, almost 100 years ago, that was a dream. But now it exists and our kids have that. We have that. Yes. Yes. Is yes. this going to prevent us, or our kids, from dreaming even bigger, or will those devices help our kids dream even bigger? The really cool part about where we're at in the world is technology and imagination are two things that should always collaborate. And when those two things come together and just seeing the possibilities of what we can do, not only just communication, with art, with how do we help each other in everyday life. I think this is a perfect place that where our minds are open, we have the elements, we have things that we could put together with technology. And who, who would have thought, you know, we, we have a, a phone. I'm on my phone right now. <laughs> you know, where you're talking and we're not in the same space, but we're talking. So I, I believe that this is the most perfect time because we have so much material. We have so much at our fingertips. And as long as you have the imagination to go as wide as you want, then I think technology, matching, matching that up with technology, we can create some really awesome things. Yeah. And I can't, it may be because, it's, because I'm so old, but I can't even imagine what's coming next in, in technology and you know um, I, and I'm so excited about it I'm so excited for my kids and uh, someday my my grandkids and uh, you know uh, it's like in in the, the possibilities are endless yes you know you think about it hey I saw you know the Jetsons right mm -hmm. if you think about we're kind of in the Jetsons air <laughs> where we have the big screens, we have the, the computers talking. Like, I, maybe it'll be like a refined Jetsons, and maybe some kids nowadays don't know about the Jetsons. <laughs> I'm aging myself. But you never, I, I can't imagine what else. I mean, I, I think life is great. You can go outside, you can play, you have these VR things where I have, I've, ran into the wall with that thing on before. <laughs> <laughs> but you you know, you have you have all this entertainment, you have all these possibilities. So I I couldn't imagine and that's why we need dreamers and that's why we need people who think outside the box because, you know, I think what we have now going on is really cool. But if you have somebody who, who dreams and goes beyond that it's no limit to what they cre can create and kind of make life a little better with, with what they got, with all the creations that they create. I agree. I agree. And I'd never thought of, about, uh, you're right, we are kind of living that Jetson lifestyle, except for the flying cars. And to be honest with you, the way people drive on the ground, I'm kind of glad we don't have flying cars because I don't, I don't think we can handle it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, how does it feel to be a, um, a children's author and a children's science kit maker? <laughs> it, you know what? It feels amazing, but I, I have a vision for why I want to – I have two other books that I'm writing uh, that I'm over, writing the overview and things like that. So I definitely want to create more books. And, like when you come out with one, you're like, oh, my gosh. I definitely am working on the prequel to this. Leticia, who is the artist, the illustrator, um, she 
got to kind of open up her mind and she was really excited so she's ready uh, whenever I'm done writing um, but it does it feels amazing but it's definitely hard work mm-hmm. um, I created my own uh, publishing called play along publishing LLC and I solely really could have created it so that I would have the autonomy and the and the rights to to what I could put in my book and and kind of have some more control over that but even that in itself you have to think about the marketing the business side of it uh, where you not only want yes it's great that I got my book out and I love that I get to integrate my science background and my love for science for a venture into this but you have to get it out to the world and that's a that's a that's another monster for my uh, to be honest It's it's a lot of hard work but it's wonderful when you know you have a vision, you're trying to get there, and then once you get there, you're like, okay, okay, I want to go here. <laughs> you want to well, keep going. Yeah, well, I, I and I love that, and I think that that's uh, one of the conversations we can have with our kids while we're reading I Am the Moon, letting them know that their dreams can come true and there's nothing that can stop them except themselves and to go for it. That's it. The great thing about dreaming, and and not everything is going to be perfect, and that's okay. It's not intended to be perfect, but I think some of, and even in my journey, I knew nothing about publishing a book. (laughs) So this whole journey has been one big learning curve for me, and it, there have been times where I just was like, oh, I don't know what, where am I going? When you think you're going up, you're going down. Or when you think you're going in a good direction, then you're rethinking, like, oh, that was not a good direction. So no matter what, it's the pivot. It's the adjustment that maybe your dream is not going in a direction that you want it to go, but it's okay to pivot. It's okay to readjust. And when you readdress, you may even be a, even in a better position that you, that you didn't even know you wanted to get to. Yeah. Well, this is great. Well, I know one place... We want everybody to get to, it's what well, not the moon right now, but where we want to go to your website so we can learn more about I Am The Moon, learn more about you, and learn more about that cool Nebula Jar Kit creation. Yes, you can find me at www.ChristinaTheAuthorDixon.com. Um, it's also the same for Facebook and Instagram. It's Christina underscore the underscore all the underscore Dixon <laughs> on Facebook, and Instagram. We've had a wonderful time dreaming with our guest. She's the author of I Am the Moon. Her name is Christina Dixon. Christina, thank you so very much for being with us. Before we invite our guests into the studio, I want to ask you, are you looking for a unique way to support diverse voices in literature? Introducing Buy YQ Book Fairs where every page tells a story of empowerment, culture, and diversity. Buy YQ Book Fairs is a 100% women and minority-owned initiative showcasing a hand-picked selection of diverse books that celebrate inclusivity and representation. From captivating narratives to thought-provoking poetry, our curated collection has something for everyone. And hosting a Buy YQ Book Fair is a super easy and a fantastic way to raise funds for your organization or cause. So why wait? Visit buyyobq.com today to learn more about how you can bring the magic of diverse literature to your community while supporting women and minority-owned businesses. This episode is brought to you by Think Outside. Are you ready to unlock a world of adventure for your older kids and teens? Introducing the award-winning Think Outside Outdoor Monthly Subscription Boxes. Give your kids the gift of nature with our thoughtfully curated boxes designed for kids ages 7 and up. Each month, they'll receive a bundle of excitement right at their doorstep. Packed with enriching activities, gear, and adventures, our subscription boxes are more than just a package. They're a gateway to a lifelong love of the great outdoors. So say goodbye to screens and say hello to streams as your kids embark on nature-themed challenges that ignite their imagination and sharpen their outdoor skills. If you're a regular listener of Reading With Your Kids, you've heard countless experts tell us that getting your kids off their screens and out into nature is a great way to support your kids' mental health. It's easy to get started. 
go to our homepage, readingwithyourkids.com, scroll down to the Think Outside banner, give the banner a click, and simply choose between your Think Outside and Think Outside Junior programs. Select your payment plan and await the thrill of each month's themed shipment. Don't miss out on the opportunity to bond with nature and create unforgettable memories with your kids. Subscribe to Outdoor Monthly Subscription Boxes today and watch your kids thrive in the great outdoors. Join us right now from the beautiful state of Massachusetts. Our guest is here today to celebrate her children's books. She likes to say that she writes relatable Christian content that is not cheesy. Please welcome to the show the very uncheesy Sarah Gaston. Hey, Sarah, how are you? Hi, I'm great. Thanks for having me. I'm delighted to have you on. Tell us, um, tell us about your latest book. Sure. So um, my latest book is actually called Daisy Dump Truck, God is With Me. And it is about an anxious dump truck who learns to trust in God. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So that's the kind of your thing. You're, you, you're writing about trucks and other things that little kids are really into. And you're giving them personalities just like every other children's author does. And you're reminding those characters that God loves them. Yeah. So I was a preschool teacher, actually, for the first, uh, for 10 years before I had my son, Milo, who's actually three. He's a preschooler now, and I homeschool him. Um, And so uh, last year, actually, at church, he was turning two and a half. So he was transitioning from the nursery into toddler preschool. And we just noticed that he was having such a tough time with the transition. Everything was new, and uh, he was just crying. And so I know how important a book can be for transition. So my husband and I, we scoured the Internet trying to find a book about going to church, animals going to church, people going to church, anything going to church, and found nothing. So I actually wrote my first book called Baby Dino Goes to Church on my phone, on the Notes app. And... I would read it to him at night. Uh, One thing led to another. He memorized it. And one night he asked me, Mama, can we please get this book at the library? (laughs) And I said, well, it doesn't exist. So I had it illustrated and published it. And then all his friends at church wanted it. And it actually helped him. He walked in that next Sunday confident. He he was quoting the book. It was great. (laughs) You know, that's re- we've talked a lot here on the podcast uh, about how much easier it is for kids to talk about some subjects while they're talking about a character in a book. So if there's a kid and, you know, a parent wants to sit down and talk about bullying or other situations that it's tough to talk about, sometimes it's a whole lot easier. You get a book where the character is being bullied You sit down, you talk about the character, and then maybe something that's happening at school comes out and the kid feels much more comfortable. makes perfect sense that when we're talking about a subject like God, that that, that you've been intentionally created by this being that loves you and cares about you, and by the way, created everything, and he created you, that might be easier for a kid to digest if they're talking about it in the context of Oh, God created this dump truck and this 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 squirrel or dinosaur exactly. and you know yeah exactly yeah I love to write directly to the child's level uh-huh. um, and it might be simple things that don't really matter to us but they're things that the little kids encounter in their daily life every day and they matter a lot to them so I like to write in simple language and yeah just not too far over their head so they can grasp it. Yeah. Now, we're not a, um, a religious podcast here, although people know that I'm Catholic and, and a Christian, mm-hmm. and uh, we've celebrated uh, many different tradi- faith traditions. What would a person who's not uh, – a, a, what, what value would, would a family that's not a, a Christian family or it doesn't have a faith tradition? Are, are your books something that you think they would uh, welcome into their home and, and – you know, um, uh, yeah, benefit yeah. from? I, yeah, I think mainly they've been a resource for Christian families who are just really looking for 
relatable content for their kids, but I definitely have had people tell me, oh my gosh, like my kid picked up this book and I'm learning things and they, they were never in church and they are learning the foundations, you know, in very simple language. And I had someone, especially my Christmas book, I think, because I think people are more open to hearing about Jesus with uh, Christmas books and learning about the birth of Jesus. So yeah, that's that's a great thing about um, the non-cheesy aspect is that it also appeals to, to adults who might not have any religious background at all. I've definitely seen uh, some great responses like that, yeah. Wow, really cool. And now, what is it um, about your why, – why do you feel that you're I, – I know the first book was written because your kid was having trouble transitioning – at church, yeah. But you've continued to write uh, in in the Christian in Christian field. What is it? Why is that so important to you? Yeah, I think just I grew up in the church, and I really didn't realize the lack of relatable Christian content for kids. I feel like this age group, mainly what I write for, is two to five. I've had some six and eight year olds who really like my books too, but. Um, I just find that that age group can often be overlooked and the books that I have found or that I was gifted when he was born um, that had a Christian title or whatever uh, were very sweet and had all true beautiful words but just connected more with the parent Um, you know it would make me cry or ooh and ah over the words the poetic flowery words but you know, Milo, it would, he would just glaze over and have no idea what was going on. So I just, the things that I would find that I wanted to teach him, like simple beginnings of how to pray. Um, I didn't find a book that really spoke to him in simple language like that. So I would honestly, I just started writing books that I couldn't find for him Mm -hmm. um, with just whatever he was into at the time. So bulldozers, Ozzy the Hedgehog. So stuff like that. Isn't it, isn't it fascinating that kids aren't impressed with flowery prose? Right. And, but meanwhile, you know, a, a joke about a fart just, you know, <laughs> knocks them out. Just, you know, exactly. they repeat it all day long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, you're right. You, it is important to know your audience and to write um, for your audience. You don't want to dumb things down, but, right. you know, yeah. Yeah. I'm curious. Um, we just had an author, I just interviewed an author that was talking about um, the fact that she has moved into writing chapter books after writing a number of picture books. She's moved in and written her first chapter book because her audience, the kids that, that have been reading her books, are getting older and that age. And so she wants to continue to write for that audience. Uh, is that something that you're thinking about doing? Actually, yes. You read my mind because I've just started a chapter book. Um for 11 or 12 year old girls right now about faith and Bible verses and horses and stuff like that. So, and I have a feeling that I'm going to be writing as, as Milo grows up different when I find different gaps in maybe what I want to teach him or what he's into. So yeah, I'm really excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love that. I love that, you know, there, there was a need and you filled that need. And um, I think there are so many parents out there that, um, are in a similar situation, and um, I, I hope that you, they are inspired by you to go out and uh, you know follow your lead and um, sit down and, and be creative and, and write, create those stories for their kids. Yeah. yeah. You were sharing with me before we started um, recording that there have been some people that um, have kind of protested your your work and not. We're not talking about people who are anti-Christian, but people within the church who are upset that you're writing about a Jesus-loving dinosaur. Can you talk a little bit about that? I'm finding as I tell certain people, um, I get either love or hate reactions, I find. And I'm very surprised because I wasn't really expecting this. Um, A lot of people have deep-seated trauma and just things that have happened in their life where I'm finding that, Sometimes even the title of my book can trigger something and they lash out. I've gotten very mean comments, but um, 
most people, it, I think it's a love it or hate it kind of thing I'm finding. Uh -huh. um, and I, at first, it really bugged me. I would cry and get really upset about the messages that I would receive. Um, and I think I've grown and I, I, I like to talk to these people now if they'll talk to me mm -hmm. and, you know, try to say, well, you know, why is it that this, you know, and it, try to explain what I'm doing and how I'm not forcing anything on anyone, but, you know, uh -huh. my books are here because they're needed. Yeah. So if it, yeah. if it interests them <laughs> yeah. or not. It is interesting that people who are so committed to um, a doctrine of love and communion can be so unloving and uncommunicable sometimes. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. Well, what do, is there a, a next book that you're? Uh, you, you told me that you're working on a chapter book, but is there another picture book that you're working yes, on right now? So this year, I'm about to release a counting book called Ten Faithful Monster Trucks," um, because my son and his friends are really into monster trucks. Um, and there's another book coming called My Friend's Name is Jesus. It's a very relatable, simple story about how you can talk to Jesus throughout the day and that he cares. And if you're mad or sad, you can tell him. So that's wow. coming soon. That sounds great. Hey, I know, Sarah, people are going to want to know where they can go to find out more about you and find out more about your relatable Christian content that's not at all cheesy. <laughs> Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram or Facebook under Sarah Gaston Books or my website that my husband built, which is amazing, called sarahgastonbooks.com. We've had a great time speaking to our friend Sarah Gaston. Sarah, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Reading With Your Kids and will join us for the next exciting episode of the show. Until then, there are a lot of different ways that you can reach out to us. Let us know what you love about the show. Let us know what we could be doing better. And let us know who you would like to hear on a future episode of the show. Here are the ways you can connect with us on social media. Facebook.com slash Reading With Your Kids. At Reading With Your Kids on Instagram and TikTok. At Gently Magic on Twitter. You can also go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. And you can click on the contact button up at the top of the page to send us a message. We see them all. We respond to them all. And we'd love to respond to you. And, of course, we'd love for you to visit our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash readingwithyourkids. When you are there, you can check out our Drawing With Your Kids videos, our STEM is Family Fun videos, and you can listen to the show on YouTube. I want to thank the folks who helped to make today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to start by thanking our great guests and our wonderful sponsors. I would like to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Chris Doherty, Skylar Strauss, Nick Warner, Kyoko Ito, Kayla Newland, Kristen Barrett, Sydney Swan, and Hannah Rose. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all of the support she gives me. She is amazing. Most of all, we want to thank you. You are amazing. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the show today. And thank you so much for taking the time to make the world a better place. And you do that every single time you read with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next episode of Reading With Your Kids.